Welcome to episode two of Friendship and Fluency, Learning English with Andy and Stephanie. We're so glad that you're joining us again or joining us for the first time of this podcast where we focus on language learning and specifically learning the English language. I'm Andy and I'm joined again by my wonderful wife, Stephanie. Hey everybody, glad to be with you again and we're excited about today's content. Let's get started. So we're going to begin our podcast today by talking about a very common American idiom. Mm -hmm. The problem with idioms is that the words used in the phrase often have no connection. They seem to have no connection with the meaning of that phrase and the situations that it's used in. So if you were to look up the dictionary definition of the words in these idioms, mm -hmm. the meaning would be very hard to connect with the situation that right. the native speakers are using it in. That's why idioms are so tricky, and that's why they're so much fun. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the historical origin of the idiom helps it make a lot more sense. In this case, we don't really have a solid historical origin story for this idiom that we're going to talk about today. And the idiom is to let the cat out of the bag. To let the cat meow, out of... Thank you for that. Out of the bag. <laughs> Sound effect. <laughs> Someday we will do a podcast episode on the sounds of animals in English. Oh, yeah. Because That'll it's be a so fun one. interesting. In every language, animals make slightly different sounds. Mm -hmm. And it's important, relatively important, to know what does a cat say in English versus what does a cat say in Kurdish mm -hmm. or other languages. So to let the cat out of the bag. To let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> it brings to mind this picture, if you take it literally, of uh, a, a kid carrying a bag. What are those rice bags made out of in Kurdistan? Kind of like burlap? Almost yeah. like a burlap bag, and inside mm -hmm. there's this kitten angry. medium grown An angry cat, cat and it's very angry because it's been shut up in this bag and the the small child is holding on to the top and trying to keep it contained but the longer it's in there the angrier the cat gets until all of a sudden it springs out of the bag and uh there's there's no getting that cat back in that bag if a cat is in a bag and is released from that bag there's this effect of surprise mm -hmm. and Maybe slight panic. Yeah, maybe some fear. For those in that <laughs> environment, yeah. uh, the cat will not gently, stylishly walk out of that bag, right? The cat will fly out of that bag, growling mm -hmm. and running as fast as it can to get out of that situation. So to let the cat out of the bag, what does it actually mean mm -hmm. in the usage of native English speakers? Yeah. What does it mean and where do we use it? Yeah, it typically refers to a situation where there's some information that is needing to be kept contained. So maybe it's secret or sensitive or just something that isn't to be widely shared with everyone. Um, but a few people know it. And to let the cat out of the bag is an idiom we use when someone releases that information in a way that they weren't supposed to. Yeah, so a scenario like a surprise birthday party. Uh, I think this has happened to a friend of mine where she was planning a surprise for her husband and she told her daughter, who was three or four, at one point before the party, the little girl said to her dad, Daddy, I'm not going to tell you the secret about your party. <laughs> <laughs> right. So she let the cat out of the bag. She let her dad know about That's the surprise. Right. Yeah. So there's this secret information. Usually it's about something positive. Mm -hmm. So it might be about a secret party. Maybe it's about a young couple that's going to get married. Mm -hmm. Maybe they've agreed, their families have agreed, but the neighborhood doesn't know yet. Most of their friends don't know yet. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's about a life change, have an exciting new job change, or you're moving to another mm -hmm. city. And for whatever reason, you want to keep that secret for a temporary period, mm -hmm. and then someone that's the cat out of the bag. Mm -hmm. Someone reveals that secret before they are supposed to. 
And that's when we use this idiom. Mm -hmm. It could be used for negative things, negative situations, but mostly it's used for positive situations. Maybe a business is going to close. The management is going to wait to tell their employees. Somebody on the management team forgets about the plan. Mm -hmm. They tell an employee the business is closing in two months and uh, and the rest of the management blames them. They say, you let the cat out of the bag Mm -hmm. before you were supposed to. It's hard to keep a secret. Yes. I would love to hear from any of our viewers or listeners if there have been times when they maybe forgot about something that was supposed to be a secret. Right. And let the cat out of the bag. So feel free to share if that's appropriate. It happens and it's embarrassing (laughs) when you do it. That feeling from your head to your feet when you realize you just shared something that was meant to be a secret. We have another idiom that has a very similar meaning, and that is to spill the beans. Oh, yeah. To spill the beans. We yeah. use both of these idioms in the same kinds of situations. Mm-hmm. I have a video on my YouTube channel where I talk about that idiom, to spill the beans. Mm-hmm. And I tell the story of one time when we were in the area of Hauraman mm-hmm. in Kurdistan, And our son was maybe four years old. He went up to this giant sack of walnuts and he touched it and the sack fell over and walnuts spilled all over the floor of the shop. And we were so (laughs) embarrassed. We 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 were like, I'm so sorry. That's what it feels like when you let the cat out of the bag or you spill the beans as you feel very embarrassed. and like, Oh no, now I need to try to repair the situation. But you can't, it's too late. Yeah. It's too late. So that is what it means to let the cat out of the bag. Now, one of the most common questions that I get as an English teacher Mm -hmm. is students who say to me, teacher, I, I know how to read and write. I have a pretty good understanding of English when, when English uh, is being spoken, but when I go to speak, I get stuck or I'm afraid. Or I don't know what happens. My brain just fries. And all Mm -hmm. of the the vocab I memorized and the phrases I memorized, Mm -hmm. they're just gone. What kind of advice, what kind of tips would we give to the many students, really, who find themselves in this kind of situation? First of all, I think I would just say I have a lot of compassion (laughs) for learners. Our identity is often so closely tied to our words, how we are able to make ourselves known and know other people is typically through words. And so there's a lot of pressure building up to these moments. There can be a lot of pressure building up to these moments where you're going to speak in another language. So I think a way to let off some of that pressure, dissipate that pressure, is to find a place where you can be speaking in English as often as possible that is low stress and low pressure. So things like evaluations and classes are so necessary and so helpful. You get more benefit out of those times if you are really pursuing conversation in in English. I had a a dear friend who did that for me uh, when I first started learning Kurdish and could say a handful of words because we would talk three times a week, uh, just on the phone, and then eventually video chat. Conversation just became normal. Making mistakes became normal, and then growth became normal. So for someone who feels stuck in their speaking, Mm -hmm. our advice to them would be find a tutor that you feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. It could be a friend, but a tutor would be ideal, even better. A native speaker, if possible, But it doesn't even have to be a native speaker, someone who is ahead of you Mm -hmm. in English, if you're learning English, Mm -hmm. and can help you to feel relaxed and help you to grow your confidence as you are speaking. So that is a huge Mm -hmm. part of this. You need someone that you can be speaking with on a regular basis and gaining confidence in certain areas of the language. Mm -hmm. And that really leads to another piece of advice that builds on the first one, which is when you are speaking, feel free to come back to those areas of speaking that you feel the most comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So let's say the conversation goes in a 
direction that you just don't have any vocab for. You haven't mm-hmm. learned the verb forms for that. Let's say they're talking about a certain kind of science, and you have not learned anything in English about that science. When it's polite and appropriate,、yeah. bring the conversation back to talking about topic that you have studied, where you have more、mm-hmm. confidence. Feel free as you go into these other topics you feel less comfortable with. Bring it back to the areas where you feel more comfortable. As you keep doing that again, what you're doing is you're reinforcing these areas you know. You're having the confidence then to be able to go out and experiment a little bit in some other topics, and then come back to the areas where you are very comfortable. So those are a couple of pieces of advice. Find a tutor or a friend you feel safe with to be speaking. Exercising that speaking muscle on a regular basis, multiple times a week if possible. Then, in conversations in that language, return to areas that you're more comfortable and confident in. That will help you grow in confidence. I think that's great advice, and I think I would just add: it could be that the reason you are feeling stuck is that you just don't have enough of a certain kind of English. Maybe you don't have enough. Grammar forms. If you only know simple past and simple present, you might need to go focus on a verb tense or two in order to feel more confident heading into a conversation. If you knew you were heading into a, a time with a tutor, and if you even knew ahead of time what the topic of that conversation would be, you can have、yeah. confidence. Okay, I know what the parameters or the boundaries of this conversation will be, and I will get what I need for this conversation, and then I can just. Try without fear of making a mistake. Well, I hope that advice was helpful for you. If this is something that you struggle with, if you have any follow-up questions on this topic, please write those questions in the comments of this video or this podcast. It would be really our joy to interact with you、mm-hmm. about those questions. Another very common problem that people face as they're learning. Specifically, American English、mm-hmm. is how to pronounce the American R. The American R is maybe the hardest sound of our particular dialect of English,、mm-hmm. of our particular accent, and it's so hard that even our own children struggle with this sound.、Mm-hmm. I couldn't make this sound correctly until I was six years old. I had to go to a special speech therapy class when I was in second grade. Our daughter couldn't say it as well until she was six years old, and、right. we have our youngest son,、uh, Jojo. He's almost five years old,、mm-hmm. and he still can't say the American R. We're not worried about it because、That's、so cute. Because、uh, <laughs> it does give him a cute accent when、yes. he can't say the R. Like he can't say his sister's name, Nora. Right now, he says Noah. Noah. So it's very cute, but probably when he's six or seven years old,、mm-hmm. he'll grow out of that as well. But for adult. Students of the English language, we do want to give you some advice, some tips about making this difficult sound. There are some strategies. There、mm-hmm. are some practices that can help you to get closer to this sound,、mm-hmm. even if it will take a long time for it to sound natural. So the first thing that you should focus on is a sound in your own language that this is close to. So many languages would have something that you could call a flapped R sound. In、mm-hmm. Kurdish, there's two R's. There's the trilled R, r,、mm-hmm. and then there's the shorter, the softer R, which is just the tongue just touches the roof of the mouth once. R,、mm-hmm. R, as opposed to R.、Mm-hmm. So the trill, like Spanish or Kurdish, the R goes multiple times. The tongue touches the top of the mouth multiple times. But with this softer R, it just touches the top of the mouth. This is this is the front of your tongue.、Mm-hmm. Just touches the top of the mouth once, lightly. Ah, so that sound. Focus on that sound if you have that sound in your language, and now try to make that sound with the front of your tongue, almost but not touching the top of your mouth.、Mm-hmm. So instead of saying ar, ar. Ah, what happens in、mm-hmm. your mouth when your tongue doesn't touch? It's close, but、mm-hmm. it doesn't quite touch. And it's a really unique shape <laughs> in、yes. your mouth、uh, for this sound. And I do think that's a really、mm-hmm. good way to explain it. 
There's two other pieces regarding the shape of your mouth that you can pay attention to if it's helpful for you. One is the shape of your lips as you're making this sound. You want your, your lips, the front of your mouth, to be in the shape of making the er sound. Mm -hmm. So er, as your tongue is close to the top of your mouth, your lips and the front of your mouth should be making kind of an er, should be out a little bit, er, and then actually for speakers of American English, when we're making this sound for our tongue, the back sides of our tongue, they're actually kind of raised a little bit and touching the inside of our teeth. They're touching the, in, the upper part of our mouth. So you've got the back of the tongue is sort of raised, touching the insides of the teeth. The front of the tongue is, is almost touching the top. The lips are in this er position. And I really like that sound er because if the R is at the beginning of the word, mm -hmm or the middle, or the end, that's the position you want your mouth to be in, in mm -hmm. order to make that sound. Let's say it's at the beginning of a word, like really, really. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's in the middle of a word, like very, mm -hmm. very. Or it's at the end of the word, like better, mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. You hear that sound, er. If you prepare your mouth to make the er sound, you can make an R, whether it's at the frontal or or end position mm -hmm. of a word. So if you struggle with making the American R sound, don't worry, I did too. Native speakers struggle with that sound a lot, and many, many students of American English have a hard time with our mm -hmm. R, mm -hmm. uh, the roticity, as they call it, of the American accent. Many British accents just leave it open. They don't make the tongue come close to the mouth. It's just open. Better, you know, mm -hmm. instead of better. So it's difficult, but keep working at it, keep practicing. And it may sound a little bit dense in the beginning. Like, arr, arr. If that's happening to you, try to relax your tongue. Relax your tongue. Your tongue right, should be. We're not be, pirates. Arr, that's right. <laughs> Sometimes when people try to speak the American accent, it sounds like they're, they've got a lot of things in their mouth. Their, their tongue yeah. is too stiff. Arr. You want to relax your tongue, focus on the er shape of your lips, and your tongue almost touching the top of your mouth. So I hope that can help any listeners who might struggle with that part of our language. Now, Stephanie, you have a tongue twister full of American R's. I do. I'm going to show off a bit. <laughs> so if you want to challenge your English ability, try to learn this tongue twister that Stephanie is going to present for us. You Just, have another video, don't you? I Where, do. Of tongue twisters. Of Kurdish friends yeah. saying a bunch of American tongue twisters. Mm -hmm. We have another video where we and our children are saying a bunch of Kurdish tongue twisters. Yeah. Those are a lot of fun to make. A uh, tongue twister is a number of sentences together, very difficult to say because of all of the sounds in the sentence. Mm -hmm. So why don't you give us an example? So twister. I'll say it uh, twice. The first time I'll say it slowly so you can hear um, all of the different er sounds. And then I will say it as fast as I can. So it's Betty Bader bought some butter, but the butter, it was bitter. So she put it in her batter and it made her batter bitter. So she bought a bit of better butter, better than the bitter butter, and she put it in her batter, so her batter was not bitter. So, twas better Betty Bader bought a bit of better butter. Wow. So that was the slow version. Okay. So the main character in this tongue twister is Betty Bader, and she has bought some butter, and the butter was bitter and has caused all these problems. All right. Betty Bader bought some butter, but the butter, it was bitter. So she put it in her batter and it made her batter bitter. So she bought a bit of better butter, better than the bitter butter. And she put it in her batter and her batter was not bitter. So it was better. Betty Bader bought a bit of better butter. Wow. I can't do that. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> if you can, let me know in the comments. Yeah. That uh, that's an impressive tongue twister. And is helping you to pronounce the American R. Mm. There's another difficult American sound we'll talk about in a future episode called the flap T, which mm. is the T 
often double T in the middle of American words mm -hmm. and uh, how it makes a sound that's close to a D, somewhere between a D and a T. That would be a good tongue twister for that sound also. All right, I'll get working on it. Excellent. So I wanted to ask you also about a specific language learning practice mm -hmm. that you found helpful when you were studying Kurdish. Sometimes it's helpful to just focus on one method, one practice that really served a language learner as they were studying a language. So can you share one of the things that you did that really helped you? Yeah. So one um, practice that I found extremely helpful for myself and for a number of people that I've coached is to pick a set of stories and then to go really deep into that specific set of information. You've got your four kind of skill areas, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Often when people are learning language, there's so much to cover. There's so much to learn. It can be really overwhelming knowing where to focus and it can make people feel kind of scattered and anxious. But to take kind of a small set of information. So for me, that was stories. For someone else, it might be a few songs or a few poems, but a, a specific set of information and then go deep into that, listen to that, read that. After you read it, write it down. Mm -hmm. After you read it, see how much you can say, see if you can memorize it, see if you can listen to a sentence and then repeat that sentence, or then listen to the entire thing and see how much you can summarize. Like there's so many different things you can do with the same set of information. And when you're really trying to go into all four of those skill areas, reading, writing, listening, speaking, that information is getting solidified in your mind and in your ability to use it. So I had a set of stories. I would listen to it for an hour or two almost every day. These were audio stories. These were audio stories. So for a busy mom, you know, that was very handy. I could just put in my headphones while I was washing the dishes or walking to get my kids from school, um, I would listen to it. And then I would read the same story in English and in Kurdish. And then for me, I had the added benefit of Kurdish being, you know, kind of having two forms that you've got the script and you've got the Latini. Different so I was of writing different it. ways of writing it. So I think just picking something to really focus on for a specific amount of time is a really good practice where you can see a lot of benefit in that specific sphere rather mm. than being kind of all over the place and trying to learn everything all the time right and not seeing very much growth focusing in seeing growth there right being encouraged by that and and feeling kind of empowered and proud and like okay yes i can i can gain new skills and i can use it and i'm good at studying i'm good at learning language so here we have a specific practice that you've shared, which was listening to these audio stories that you had in Kurdish and in English mm -hmm. and using that comparison, listening to them over and over again mm -hmm. to really go deep in a small set of information. Mm -hmm. So that's a specific practice. But then you've also shared a really wise principle, which is pick a focus Mm -hmm. For a temporary period of time, maybe one week, maybe a month, it's up to you. But rather than trying to do everything at once, really our brains are helped by having a singular focus. This week, I'm really going to focus on listening to this story set. This week, I'm really going to focus on reading. Or I'm really going to focus on telling this story from my past. Learning how to tell this story. And having that singular focus gives you encouragement because you're able to see progress mm -hmm. in one thing. You're able to gain skill and even mastery of one small part of the language. Mm -hmm. Connects back to this principle that we shared in our previous episode about mm -hmm. going one step at a time. How do you right. eat an elephant one bite at a time? Right. Well, it's helpful if each bite has a particular focus. Specific flavor. A specific, a specific flavor, <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's a lot of wisdom in that, I think, in how our brains learn and also just in staying motivated. It's amazing how if you are doing a hundred things, you feel like you're making no progress. Right. 
But if you focus on one or two, you emotionally, you feel like you are making progress Mm -hmm. and that makes you encouraged and that helps you to keep going. And this is one of the things that I really love about language learning and helping other people learn language is kind of creative solutions. So yes. even right now, as you're talking about this, I'm like, I'm thinking of ideas, you know, I'm thinking of a, an advanced or intermediate level Kurdish person who wants to get better in their English and how they could use news articles to do that or songs or poetry or yeah, it's I really enjoy that. So let us know what your particular struggles are in language learning, because we love helping language learners to find creative solutions to their struggles. So please let us know in messages or comments. Mm -hmm. We'd love to help you with your particular struggle. So every episode... Speaking of struggles... (laughs) We want to finish every episode with a funny language learning mistake or funny story from our own experience or the experience of our friends or family Mm -hmm. in language learning. And today you're going to share with us a story from very early on Mm -hmm. in our time in Kurdistan. Maybe, wow, three weeks after we arrived, this happened? Yeah, three weeks to a month. So what happened? Yeah, well, I was last week saying that it's really valuable to be able to laugh at yourself, be Mm -hmm. able to laugh at your mistakes and that Something to look forward to with those mistakes is that someday you can tell that language blooper or that language mistake in the local language, and it can be something that even becomes a way of connecting with local people. So, uh, eat my own words. (laughs) So, we had been in Kurdistan about a month, and at that time, our son was four and our daughter was two. We had left our house on a Friday. We were just walking down the street to a friend's house. We were still new in the neighborhood and kind of learning uh, where everything was and trying to orient ourselves to different landmarks and things. And so we walked down our hill and turned onto the street where we thought our friend's house was. And as we walked through the gate, our son Micah got so excited about going to his friend's house that he missed a step. So you know, you've got those lovely concrete steps outside. <laughs> tile. Concrete yeah. with so sharp he missed, tile edges. He just missed the step with his little four-year-old legs, and he just hit the sharp edge of the outside step right here with his forehead. So he came up, you know, gushing blood and just screaming. And his sister, who's two, sees the blood. She starts screaming. I see the blood, and I start kind of going into panic take care of my kids mom mode. So I walk up the rest of the steps, leaving Andrew outside with the kids. And I don't knock on the door because I know my friends are home. I just turn the doorknob, go into the kitchen. And I'm, I'm scanning the kitchen counters. I'm looking for a towel or, you know, Kleenex or anything to try to take outside to staunch the blood flow. And I remember there were two trains of thought in my mind. One was hearing Micah and Nora screaming outside. Mm -hmm. And the other was registering in my mind, oh, this kitchen looks a little bit different than the last time we were here. Huh, that's interesting. They must have changed around the furniture. But interesting, okay, whatever. So I grab, uh, you know, some toilet paper and I go outside and I'm trying to get it off and help Micah and help Nora and there's just, there's blood screaming and all over the blood steps. and we're trying to help mm-hmm. the kids calm down. And then I look and in the doorway of this home appears a Kurdish woman. Not our friends that we were expecting. Yeah, so our friends were American. This was a stranger. <laughs> and earlier we talked about that feeling from your head to your feet. I, I got this horrible hot flash of this is not our friend's house. I just busted into a Kurdish woman's house on a Friday morning, leaving my children screaming in her courtyard and stole stole her toilet paper. You stole her Kleenex. I stole her Kleenex. (laughs) And I remember she looked at me and I looked at her and I looked at you. And all I could say in Kurdish at that time was, Kurakam, Kurakam, which means my son, my son. And I, I handed her back the tissues 
And I remember she had this look of absolute bewilderment on her face. <laughs> and she unwound some more and handed it to me. And then we just left because I couldn't say anything right. else in Kurdish. And she didn't know what was going on. So we walked away and our children were still screaming <laughs> and there was still blood. And we realized we were exactly one street up yeah. from where our friend's house was. And it was the exact same style. It was style the exact same house. style of house, same color, same mm. looking uh, gate and steps. But we had gone one street down from our house instead of two. So then we went to the uh, emergency hospital, the only one open on a Friday morning. The doctor there uh, put stitches in our son's forehead. The stitches is when you, you have a needle and thread and you sew a wound shut. And there was still a lot of blood. And right over his head, it was winter, and so you had a heater. Mm -hmm. And I was right there, like, watching what was happening. And I'm right by the heater. And so I remember I didn't have breakfast or something. Yeah, I remember I, I looked up from my from our son and I looked over <laughs> at Andrew and his face was just white and he was he was swaying a little bit and he started to kind of sit down against the wall. And I remember saying, don't sit there. There's blood. <laughs> There's blood everywhere. Go find a better spot to yeah. sit down. And uh, so our, I did. I went over and I found a better spot to yeah. sit down. We had another American teacher with us who drove us to the hospital. And he said something funny to me like, you can't pass out now. You can't faint now. You'll make Americans look bad or something. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's a strange concern for a time like this. Yeah. So, But thankfully, yep. our son was fine. He yeah, had this, a little scar he's still. He's got a little, little battle wound there, but the doctor did a good job. Um, and there was no infection. And we wonder, like, what do they make of that strange story? I don't know. Yeah. But we're thankful for those Kleenex. So <laughs> collect your language learning bloopers. And Lord willing, you'll be able to tell them someday to encourage other people. Now, it's interesting because when you are in a crisis, adrenaline of uh, chemicals in your body yeah. increase uh -huh. and your language speaking ability in a foreign language actually goes down yeah that's true i so, probably could say a little bit more i'm sure i could have said thank you it was just everything went out of my mind except for kudikum, kudikum. so you should know that if you're in a crisis situation where your body is feeling your mind is feeling right. a little unsafe or a little bit panicked your language ability is going to decrease in that situation that's totally normal Absolutely normal. Don't get worried about it. It'll come back up. Right. But it's another reason for pushing hard to become advanced in any language. Because mm -hmm. if you're in an emergency situation right. and your level drops, right. you want it to drop from something like an advanced to intermediate. You don't want it to drop down to like a beginner where you can't say anything. Mm -hmm. So keep working hard on your language. You might be in an emergency situation and need to use it. And you might find that uh, using it is more difficult than you expect. Yeah, but don't judge your overall language ability. That's right. Don't don't judge it based on those moments of high stress or. And don't yeah. judge other people when they're yes. in a crisis or in an emergency. Yes. And they're trying to speak your language. They might be doing a really poor job speaking your language. <laughs> it's not their fault. Like me. It's their brain. <laughs> it's their brain's chemicals fault in that situation. Well. Thank you, everyone, for joining us again for Friendship and Fluency, learning English with Andy and Stephanie. I hope that you have learned some new things and that you've had fun listening or watching mm -hmm. this episode. Please like and subscribe and share this podcast with your friends yeah. and anyone that you think it would be helpful for. Let us know what you think of these stories, and uh, we look forward to being with you next time. Take care.